Hi, my name's um, Emma Milne, and um, it's a real privilege to have been asked to contribute to this um, Ethical Dilemmas stream. Um, I think the more that we can get people talking about welfare and ethics, um, the better. So I'm going to be looking at the breeding for extreme confirmation in companion animals. Um, and I always say this in my talks, a lot of what I'm going to say is quite obvious. Um, and I don't mean that to be patronising, but I just think it's really worth looking at these things because we, we normalise them even amongst the veterinary profession. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, I'm not affiliated with um, any, anyone uh, particularly. I'm just an independent veterinary surgeon. So I always like to look at evolution and survival of the fittest because millennia have dictated what these animals look like and, and I've got mainly the sort of felids and canids here but when you look at what nature has chosen we see that even even though these animals live in very different climates they tend to have very similar features so long straight limbs long muzzles short fur even in cold climates um, long tails open unimpaired vision and erect ears um, and you can see that across um, all forms of those species. So you'll all be aware of this. Um, you know, we've been domesticating dogs, we, we suspect for 20 to 40,000 years. Um, and of course, to start with, they were selected and bred from to do various jobs. So, you know, fast hunting dogs, smaller dogs that needed to go down different holes or, or hunt different prey, larger dogs for things like guarding, um, and cats really were just there for pest control. So they, until quite recently, have, have been largely unaffected by selective breeding, but that has started, unfortunately, to change. And then, because we don't need these animals to do a lot of these jobs anymore, um, they're quite, they, they became much more of a pet. Um, and then, in my mind, when showing started and things like the Kennel Club, um, evolved and breed the, the concept of the breed standard came along that's when everything really changed so the the uk kennel club started at the end of the 1800s and um there were 19 breeds of dog recognized at that time and now we have over 200 and i've always said this about what i call phenotypic squashing because if you have a certain, if we're trying to tell these animals apart, the breeds apart, purely by what they look like. Um, so if you have, for instance, a boxer and you want to um, create something that's quite similar to a boxer, then the boxer has to become, has to start looking different. So all the time we're introducing new breeds, we're pushing the others out towards the extremes. And I think something that is really important to get across to people is that breeds are a completely man-made concept. They do not exist in nature. And you'll find when you talk to clients or friends, or you know, if you're in conversations with people, they'll sometimes, if you start talking about a particular breed that has a lot of issues, they'll say things like, oh, so is that not a natural breed then? Um, and people are really shocked when you say to them, none of these breeds are natural. They are a completely man-made concept. And this is something that I really believe is that the concept of breed standard and breeding for looks is a major cause of unnecessary suffering. Um, and I feel really, really strongly about that. So I wanna have a look at um, the, the, the different types of extreme conformation that we see. Um, skin folds, I think are really overlooked by a lot of people. Um, I think that the when I was in practice, even cavaliers that tend to get these little uh, skin folds at the bottom here have quite intense discomfort um, and chronic infections. And when you look at animals that have been selectively bred to have these massive skin folds, I think that that is fairly unacceptable. And when you, um, the Neapolitan Mastiff on the top there was at my husband's clinic and had to have a huge portion of its uh, skin removed from its head to try and get its um, ectropian and, and diamond eye sorted out. And you see these animals, you know, with the, they've got dysfunctional lips, things like the Sharpe, which is obviously the epitome of it. Um, 
you know, I, I think a lot of the Sharpays that I saw in practice that were aggressive were because they were in chronic pain with these, these folds um, and this, you know, edema that people seem to find attractive in Sharpays. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that we, we get here is adverts with, that use dogs like this to advertise uh, skin cream and so on, which um, is something else that we need to tackle. Um, Dachshunds are becoming very, very popular um, in Europe, um, not as popular as the Brackies, which we'll come on to, but I, I really do feel when you look back at these animals, how we've changed them over the last hundred years, um, to my mind, we've effectively amputated their legs. Um, and I do wonder about the psychological impact of some of these extreme conformations on the fact that they're we, are, we must be limiting their ability to express normal behaviors like playing, jumping, um, running. Um, and then recently we've seen, um, sadly, these uh, munchkin cats being produced, which are incapable of climbing. They, some of them can't even come downstairs without falling, um, massively reduces their ability to do scratching behaviors and so on. So we really do need to, um, think about what impact these these body shapes have on the animals themselves i put there um the breed standard recently in the uk was was changed to and had the words to in the, the dogs have to have enough ground clearance you know we're basically saying that that dogs shouldn't scuff along the floor when they walk um and the fact that someone has had to write that down um without thinking that is probably not a great thing to to be asking of ourselves the ears, I, I do quite a bit of rabbit welfare um, and I'm a patron of a charity here called the Rabbit Welfare um, Fund and Association. And um, we recently had a whole ethics day on rabbits and I was doing an extreme confirmation. And when you look at these, these are, uh, the, with the, the huge ears here are English lops. Um, and I think that the, there's no one that can argue that that is acceptable to breed an animal that is going to traumatize a part of its body all the time. Um, these animals, even the rabbits, even have problems with thermoregulation because their ears are so large and it can even stop them being able to move because um, they're just so massive. Some of them grow up to, uh, are up to 70 centimeters long, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, things like the Scottish fold cats, again, quite popular. Um, and people don't understand that the cartilage defect that causes those ears to fold over affects all the cartilage in the body. So of course they're prone to, um, quite, at quite young ages, quite generalized crippling osteoarthritis. Dogs like the Basset Hound, you know, people laugh about, oh, we have to sort of peg his ears up when he eats and things like this. It's not funny um, and it's not it's not desirable. Um, and I've mentioned the hairy ear canals there. You know, when you look at normal, if you like normal for canids and felids in the wild, um, you don't find ear canals that are stuffed full of hair um, because it affects drainage and um, obviously all the things that come along with that. The coats, again, something that I feel is, is overlooked. Um, I live in the south of France and we see very hairy dogs here commonly that are just suffering in the heat. Um, again, with the rabbits, we looked at angoras when we had the ethics day. And, you know, these animals, I, I really do wonder with things like cats and rabbits that we know are fastidious groomers, things like the Persians at one end of the spectrum, the Angoras, and then I've put a photo there of the Sphinx cat. Those animals are incapable of maintaining their skin and coat. Um, and we're severely affecting their, their quality of life and the things they can do. Most people who have sphinx cats don't let them out because they're prone to sunburn and injuries. And even just grooming themselves, um, they can cause quite a lot of trauma because obviously their tongues are so um, sharp. The dogs, I, I really feel that we, 
we have to consider the lack of communication that we in, we've sort of bestowed on these animals, particularly when and in, in lots of places in the world they're still docked. So you know, you look at something like the old English sheepdog has no tail, so it can't raise or lower its tail to communicate how it's feeling. It can't make eye contact. They can't raise their hackles. Um, so we've really effectively made them completely mute. Um, and I've spoken to a few behavioral specialists who have said that they, they do tend to see some of those dogs much more being fear aggressive and, and showing sort of repulsive behaviors because, they, they're, because they're misunderstood by other dogs. So they, they learn to sort of um, strike first, if you like. Um, fly strike I've put there not just for the rabbits um, but some some of these dogs will get fly strike as well. So brachycephaly um, is a huge issue here and as I see it is the epitome of what we've done in extreme confirmation. Um, this is a screenshot of a website that I started in 2017 um, which is open to vets, students and nurses um, and related professionals. If you want to sign up or have your logos put on there, um, there's a, a, a page where you can do that. I want it really to, to be a, for, so that people all over the world can show what the level of feeling amongst the veterinary profession is. So this um, quote at the top there, I don't know if you can see it properly, um, says brachycephaly is a direct result of the stupidity of man. And this was a, something that one of the specialists speaking at WSAVA in Copenhagen said a few years ago, and it really struck me. Um, and and I've, I've sort of clung on to it and stolen it since then. Um, this, there is absolutely no way that these animals can be justified um, on, on welfare grounds. And obviously I've chosen quite drastic photos here, but these are not uncommon images. Um, and I think that the, the mental health impact of, for the vets who are seeing these animals on a daily basis, I get contacted quite often by vets who are literally just being crushed by the fact that they're just spending every day um, picking up the pieces of these animals and the heart, heartache for their owners, of course, as well. I do get a bit frustrated when people are talking about brachycephaly because all people talk about is BOAS. So there's lots of clinical CPD about BOAS. Um, but I think it's really important to remember, you'll hear some specialists saying, well, we, can, we know there are some dogs out there that can breathe, which is a pretty ridiculous thing to have to say about any breed. Um, but if you, even if you took out the, the grade two and three, and you said, right, we're only going to breed from grade one and two. The number of other diseases that come with this conformation is absolutely massive. Um, so it isn't just the BOAS. And, uh, you can read the list there. You know, th there's a, a, um, a dentist called Fraser Hale in Canada who's very, very, very um, strong on brachycephaly. And he has said that basically they are 100% malocluded by definition. Um, we're choosing those things. And when you look at things like the corkscrew tails and so on, we know that they get hemivertebrae. We're now seeing loads of French bulldogs um, with disc disease. Um, and this little dog on, on the bottom there um, is, um, a, belongs to a friend of ours here in, in France, um, Bob, and he's got many, many problems that, that come with um, his brachycephaly. In bold there, I've put inability to reproduce because I think this is absolutely fundamental. If we have um, breeds that cannot survive without veterinary intervention, then we have to ask ourselves some very, very, very probing ethical questions about that. Um, and it's not just the, the C-section um, rates, as you can see on the graph there, you know, the, the even the things like the Dachshunds, they tend to have very small litters, so they're, they're prone to oversized uh, puppies. But the rate of C-sections and elective C-sections in the brachycephalic dogs is huge. But also, they're, they're actually, there's now, a few years ago, there was one fertility clinic in the UK, and now there's over 120, I think. 
the money being made out of artificially reproducing these dogs is absolutely huge um, and is pretty much second to uh, drugs and, and weapon crimes in Europe. Um, the, the sign on the left there was um, at the Crufts, which is a big dog show in the UK, a few years ago, um, where they were blaming bulldog C-sections on us. <laughs> so that made everyone's blood pressure uh, rise significantly. But um, there was one talk that I was doing and someone in the audience was a reproductive specialist and um, she said that she had clients who had bulldogs that were physically incapable of breathing well enough to have sex, to mate, and the owners couldn't understand why they weren't good candidates. Um, so I think this is a big thing to think about. Um, and it will cause ethical dilemmas for you. I often have nurses and vets coming to me after, you know, when we're having discussions about this, um, nurses particularly being asked to do things like fertility blood sampling and so on when the dog clearly shouldn't be bred from. And I think it's something as a profession, we need to be very, very open about having ethical um, guidelines in place in practice so that everyone feels that they can speak about things that they're uncomfortable doing. Whenever you breed for looks, which is what we, everything to do with breed standards only concerns looks. So all the time that is your number one priority, you can never be prioritizing health and temperament. And we'll come on to that later. But of course, by selecting and inbreeding, we've also unwittingly ended up selecting for a lot of inherited disease. And you'll be aware of these things. Um, I used to do, I used to be a nutrition advisor for Hills um, and we would have a lot of phone calls about cysteine problems and bulldogs and this was a real, you know, these vets are facing these ethical dilemmas and I'm, when I was speaking to them, we'd say, well, we'd usually recommend neutering them because sometimes it's related to hormones and of course you don't want them to be bred from and you'd give the nutrition advice and then the vet would say, oh, well, the dogs, the, the owner doesn't want to neuter it because they want to breed from it and it's already on ZD because it's got atopy. So there, there is, there's a lack of, of thought there about whether those animals should be bred from, which of course they shouldn't. And I, I put at the bottom there about the genetic abnormal, abnormalities. So things like the Rhodesian Ridgeback, um, where in lots of places, the normal puppies with the ridgeless ones um, are culled and we're we're actually selecting for the genetic abnormalities that can cause issues um, with dermoid sinuses and things. Um, so it's not just BOAS and it's not just cats and dogs. We're doing this to all sorts of species now. Um, rabbits in the UK, about 50% of them are lop-eared and a high percentage of those are brachycephalic. Um, we're creating, you may have seen these pictures um, of this Arab foal that got a lot of media coverage here because people were horrified at the shape of its face. This horse in the corner is double muscled like Belgian blue cattle and things like fancy pigeons that are incapable of flying and goldfish that can't swim anymore. Um, it, it's almost as if people are, are seeing how far they can push these animals until they simply can't function anymore. Um, and, and to my mind, this is suffering as tangible as if they were being beaten on a daily basis, which we would never tolerate. Um, and I, I th that may sound like a, a too strong a way to put it, but I, I genuinely feel that. So as I say, breeds do not exist in, in nature. So we've created these animals that just wouldn't survive. If you look anywhere around the world where there's effectively street dogs who are surviving by survival of the fittest, they don't look like this. You don't get those extremes of animals um, because they need too much veterinary intervention. If we breed for looks, then we will never be prioritizing health and temperament. Um, and I think that's, we want, healthy, long-lived, happy family pets. Um, so health and temperament should be absolutely what we're selecting for. Dogs are beautiful animals, cats are beautiful animals. Um, they should 
we, we should stop worrying about what they look like unless we're looking for them to look healthy. Um, as I say, some of these are literally only clinging to existence through veterinary intervention. And that's something that we have to really question as a profession, I think, um, because we should be doing a lot more and we'll come on to that. So lots of people over the years when I've campaigned about extreme conformation, say you can't get rid of breeds and that, that you can't change them. Well, we have, we've changed them massively and we've introduced, we were happy with 20 back in the late 1800s and now suddenly we can't get rid of 30 that are, that are so extreme conformation that they're suffering. So um, when we look back, you can change breeds because we have. Um, the, per that is the top uh, left there is a Persian cat that was a show winning champion in I think around 1920. And as you can see, we probably would just call that a domestic long hair these days. There's nothing extreme about that cat at all. Um, when you look at the position of its nose and how flat its face is compared to modern day Persians, which now some of them, their nose is above their eyes and their faces are, are actually concave. Um, and the coats obviously are completely untenable by most owners and the cat itself. Siamese is, again, this is a, uh, a champion Siamese on the top there compared to these kind of gremlin alien looking things that we seem to favor these days. On the dog side of things, um, this is a famous portrait, self portrait by William Hogarth and his pug. Um, and you can see the legs are so much longer. The dog has a visible face, snout, no skin folds. Um, German Shepherds, we had a big uproar in at Crufts in 2018, I think, because the best in breed bitch that won the German Shepherd dog uh, best in breed was visibly hopping lame on both its back legs and had already been bred from and had hip scores that were over the average. Um, and at that point, the Kennel Club just afterwards, after all the furore, introduced a addition to the breed standard that said that the dogs should be able to stand unaided. Now, again, if someone has had to write down that a, one of the most athletic breeds in the world should be, should be able to stand without someone helping it, someone needs to have a thought process there um, and ask whether that's, you know, needs addressing, which clearly it does. Um, the bull terriers, um, I don't know why people find this, what they call a Roman nose, this sort of egg shaped head attractive, causes huge dental eruption issues. Um, and as you can see, the, the English bull terrier was a completely different dog um, a, a few decades ago. So you can change breeds and, and we really should be doing that. So there's obviously a lot of stakeholders in this. Um, so governments, I think, have a big role to play because we've tried educating people and it's not working. So until someone stops these dogs being available, which by law we could do, lots of people worry about banning breeds and it's fraught with, with difficulties. But the thing is, we should, we should be banning some of these breeds because they are literally being bred to suffer. We know that they're gonna have unnecessary suffering in their lives. So here we have quite a bit of confusion over whose responsibility it is to prosecute. There's lots of countries in Europe, including I put this, this animal welfare regulation from 2018 was added to the UK law, um, which for the first time did protect future offspring. Um, since then, not a single breeder has had a license turned down and not a single breeder has been prosecuted under that law. So these lots of European countries, and I know more obviously about Europe than I do um, uh, North America and South America, but um, where there are laws in place, they need to be enforced and they need to have the loopholes closed. Here we have um, a puppy contract, which um, I was a trustee of the Animal Welfare Foundation. Um, when we when we formulated it, everyone should be using this. We wanted to make something that was is free to download, and it makes it helps owners ask pertinent questions of the breeder, and the breeders have to really, really, um, it, it it was designed really to empower puppy buyers because a lot of the contracts empower the sellers. 
mutilations, we're having a huge surge here in ear cropping. Um, dogs, it's been illegal in the UK for absolutely years. I, I, I think it may be even long, well, decades at least. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of dogs being either allegedly imported with cropped ears or people are doing them here. Um, these are unnecessary mutilations that we should not be tolerating. Tail docking, no excuse for preemptive tail docking. Um, and banning of certain breeds, that's a discussion that um, we can have perhaps another time when we're doing back doing face to face conferences, which is the, the great thing about ethics is having those discussions afterwards. So the kennel clubs and the cat fancy and the British Rabbit Council and all those things have a massive role to play in this. Um, we've seen some really good moves by some of the Northern European kennel clubs where they've actually um, banned the registration of some of the most extreme brachycephalics. And I actually think that we these the worst affected dogs should not allow to be shown. Showing drives huge genetic bottlenecks because the champions are used um, so much for breeding and it drives demand. Crufts is viewed by millions of people um, and anything that wins immediately has a surge in popularity. We should have no more new breeds. 200's enough, you know, let's get rid of some of those. Um, the only time we should be adding new breeds is if someone wants to make a, a dog shaped dog and call it that. Um, I personally think we need to have a completely independent veterinary review of breed standards. Um, because something needs to be done there. We can't just leave it to the breeders to see how far they can push these extremes. Get the people using the puppy contract. Um, and of course, some of the countries now have opened the stud books to allow outcrossing. Some of these breeds, you know, the brachycephalics, when you look at the number that are affected, there's no way that you can save the French bulldog without adding new genetic material into that, that, um, that breed. Um, you know, lots of outcrossing studies have been done where within a few generations, you can't tell the difference between, say for example, the, the Dalmatians with urate disease were outcrossed with uh, German pointers and within a few generations, they'd got rid of the, the urates and judges couldn't tell the difference between the, the outcrossed Dalmatians and the normal ones, well, the inbred ones. Um, and the health testing should be mandatory. You know, we, we don't see a lot of changes in, you know, you, you've got dogs at Crufts that can barely breathe. No dog should win a dog show if it hasn't had the, the, the sensible health tests. I put rational there because there are hundreds of health tests that could be done, but, you know, if you are gonna let bulldogs and, and so on be shown, you've got to make sure that they've been BOAS tested. This pug here, um, I took a picture when I was at Crufts one year, and this, this dog's won shows to get to Crufts. It's had to win shows to get there, and I don't think anyone would disagree that that dog is morbidly obese and brachycephalic. So the showing world and kennel clubs, they have a, a huge responsibility um, and could make significant changes, which they tend to constantly deny they can do. So what about us? It's down to us as well, um, because we should be driving this change. Um, so I think our governing bodies should be, should be clearer about what is professional misconduct. I think reproductive services and mutilations are a good example. Um, recently, the Royal College here in the UK um, changed their guidance to say that surgical insemination, not artificial insemination, but surgical insemination was uh, professional misconduct. Um, but I think we could go, they could go a bit further. I think we really need to have practice ethical policies and meetings. Um, this is a huge issue for vets um, with mental health problems. Um, as I say, picking up the pieces of these, we should we need to have discussions about whether we're going to do assisted reproduction. Should we uh, have mandatory neutering if you do a C-section? We certainly shouldn't be doing elective C-sections um, because 
we need to see, there are quite a few breeders who've said to me my dogs all give birth naturally so I said to them okay that's great I was having a there's a woman who stalks me on Twitter who's an English bulldog breeder I said all my dogs well naturally so I said okay so look across the board let's just say no elective c-sections for two years and we'll see what happens and she went very very silent um so we should be doing um, more practice uh, ethical policies. We must stop seeing things as normal for breed. So this is a classic, you're presented with a puppy for a first vaccination, filling in a form for the insurance or writing on its clinical notes. And we should be writing all these deformities down as deformities. So if it has stenotic nares or skin folds on its face or entropion, you know, those should all be, they're not normal for a dog. Whether they're usual for a certain breed is, is irrelevant. Um, and we need to be much clearer with the owners about that. Social media, we must make sure that your practices are not sharing funny or cute videos or any extreme confirmation posts, unless you are um, being very clear about a clinical problem. Um, there's still far too many, uh, tends to be veterinary nurses, sharing pictures of them with a litter of French bulldogs saying things like, oh, look, a little, a little, we had a litter of French bulldogs in today. They're so cute. No, they're not. Stop. We have to stop. The social media is a massive driver. We have to do more to try and get to people before they get the animals. And this is something that we're, we're a bit up against the wall because by the time people come to us, They've had hours with the breeder and we've got 10 minutes, maybe 20, if you're lucky, to try and turn around poor advice and try and get them talking about possible problems that they might face. And that can be really difficult to approach diplomatically. I say stop being part of the problem. There's a Facebook group um, that I used to belong to that's vets and nurses and the number of vets that are making ridiculous choices is staggering you know people saying does anyone know where i can get one love bird well how is that possibly ever going to have its welfare needs met so we need to look at what we're doing there's quite a few vets who are breeding brachycephalic animals and extreme confirmation animals um so we need to to actually sort of recognize that we are part of the problem as well this is quite a controversial one in some countries things like bar surgery are not covered. And I actually think that we should be very strong with insurance companies and decide which conditions shouldn't be covered. Because some of these, even the progressive ones like BOAS, are so, they're so clearly breed related that they, they should be seen as congenital issues. Um, because money talks and until we can actually hit people in the wallet, if you like, for want of a better expression, we need to, um, start making people realize that they, they that these these conditions are unacceptable and this came up at wsava a few years ago we need more research into what are the maximum variations so how can we guide breeders effectively to say we want a longer muzzle if we don't know how long we want it to be um, and where the cutoff is for uh you know, where do you start to get these problems? So we need a bit more research into that. Fundamentally, one of the things that I'm really pleased to be asked to do this talk for Brazil is that um, I spoke to a Korean vet at an ethics conference a few years ago, and he said, this is just starting where we are. And I think in countries where these breeds are suddenly starting to spike in popularity, you have a real opportunity to, to nip it in the bud, which is what we should be doing. Um, learn from our mistakes and be very clear with your policymakers, be very clear with your owners and breeders, um, because we need to stop sort of treading on eggshells around the issue. Um, and I think you've got a real opportunity, particularly as young vets, when you go into practice or if you're already in practice, you are the future that can really drive that forward. Um, so most of us become vets because we have welfare and ethics at, at the heart of us. Um, so 
cling to that. Don't give up your ethical beliefs. I went and worked in the townships of South Africa for a couple of weeks with I4. Why is it that we, this is our cat Stella sitting in the Jumanji box and that's Badger and Brian who were um, animals that I used to have. Um, why are people not happy with pure mongols and moggies? I mean, they're beautiful animals. Look at these animals. They're beautiful, healthy animals, unique. Why do we want these ones that all look identical and are all unhealthy? Um, and I can't reiterate this enough. Health and temperament must come first before looks. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to contact me on social media or ask questions, you know, I'm, I'm quite easy to find Milne Vet on Instagram, Emma Milne Vet on Twitter, Emma Milne Vet on Facebook, but, I, you know, please do get in touch um, if you want to. <laughs>